What's up, Freaks? It's your boy Marty here to introduce us rip of TFTC. Thank you for joining us. Give this video a like. Subscribe to the channel. If you catch us on podcast apps, make sure you subscribe there. Give us a rating, a review. Go to tftc.io as well. Become a member of the site. Join the conversation. Truth for the commoner. Trying to get you the high signal content in a world gone mad. This rip was brought to you by good friends at River. River's here to make it as easy as possible for you to buy Bitcoin and then take it into self-custody. Go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today, uh, and you'll get $5 of Bitcoin after you buy $100 worth of Bitcoin on River. You can dollar cost average into Bitcoin with no fees. Uh, if you're just buying one off, River has the best fees in the industry. Uh, they back all their Bitcoin reserves one-to-one in multi-sig cold storage. Uh, they highly recommend that you take self-custody. They just introduced limits. So if you want to set a limit order uh, below or above the current Bitcoin price, River makes that extremely easy as well. They also have real customer support. You can pick up the phone and call them if you have any questions about your experience on River. So go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today. Enjoy this rip. Okay. Actually, most of my economics and finance books are, even, are uh, still in boxes. What are your, what economics books do you need to get up there? Oh no, I have. I mean, when we moved, I couldn't. I never, couldn't unpack like two thirds of my books because I didn't have room. So they're all all the. Uh, well, I don't know, hundreds, thousands. I don't know how many. Yeah, but economics. Con- congressmen that understand economics, we need more of them. And that's why I'm happy. Yeah. That you're running for well, my first job. I mean, you, you know, my I don't know if you knew this. My first job was at the Federal Reserve. Really, I did not know that. So we can talk about that if you want. I thought I'd get a PhD. So I don't. You know, we can talk about that. I'm happy to give my background and uh, you know whatever else is is helpful. But yeah, I was there in the Greenspan years. Interesting. Uh, the Greenspan put. And then I wrote a. Um, and then this I have on here, which is somewhere. You know, I wrote a finance textbook. <laughs> oh. How to be, How to an, be investment an investment banker. banker. Yeah, for John Wiley and Sons. So, yeah. Well, Andrew, we're recording. This is great context for the conversation. What was it like working for Alan Greenspan oh, okay. at All the right. Federal Reserve? Well, I was a junior guy. Uh, so, I was my first. I, I have an undergraduate degree in economics from the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And then had a professor, visiting professor of economics who was a full time economist at the Fed and said, you know, this would be kind of a fun place to work. You should should uh, apply. And so I wound up working as a research assistant, which is a sort of like a two year, kind of like an analyst program they have on Wall Street for people that most of whom go on and get PhDs, which I thought I'd do and decided not to. But it was kind of a fun first job out of uh, out of undergrad. I was working on in the group that studied US manufacturing, put out uh, capacity utilization numbers, industrial production numbers, working on stuff that went into the FOMC um, you know, preparation book that, you know, would then help them decide what to do with interest rates. Uh, so, you know, Greenspan, I never had a significant opportunity to uh, talk to. I mean, we used to see him in the elevator, used to hand off uh, research to him sometimes. He was a big tennis player. I never got the opportunity to play tennis with him, but uh, got to play with his doubles partner. Actually, there was a court at the Federal Reserve because he used to play all the time. So I can't, I can't say I have too many good Greenspan stories. I was there when he gave his famous irrational exuberant speech i think in uh, 96. well greenspan himself is really interesting in terms of uh former fed chairman because he had a a change of heart uh in the context of the importance of sound money versus the importance of fed the fed really stepping in and trying to facilitate um monetary policy via manipulation of interest rate and the monetary base yeah I agree. So, you know, I'm very, I'm, we'll, we'll talk about mostly, I think, about the piece I wrote about why the Fed is responsible for destroying the world. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of go back to when, when did it start? It started with the 87 crash, where, where he had just taken over from Paul Volcker, you know, who was the one that, you know, had, had clamped down on inflation after the late 70s and early 80s. And Greenspan took over. 87, you had the crash. And Greenspan said, well, we're not going to let Wall Street fail. And, uh, you know, put a lot of money, a lot of Fed money into the economy. And that became known as the Greenspan put. 
you know, later, I guess, just the Fed put, which, you know, was effectively the policy that took over everything the Fed does, which is to say, we're never going to let, you know, the financial system fail, collapse. We're never going to let Wall Street fail. We're never going to let big banks fail. Um, and I think that was a mistake. That's a huge mistake, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But I, I, I go back to Greenspan and the Greenspan put in in 87. Obviously, you can go back further and say, you know, it starts with the founding of the Fed, you know, 100 years ago. But I, I think that was the big change, the 87 crash. Now, and it's interesting learning about your experience there, because my experience out of college, I studied economics undergrad at DePaul University in Chicago and then went on to work um, at a commodity tr trading advisor. We were fun to fun of CTAs and as an analyst, that was part of my job was reading the Fed tea leaves, reading the Bank of Japan tea leaves. We trade a lot of uh, currency markets. And so I would go to the, the large prominent chief investment officers of these massive commodity trading advising funds um, and ask them. It was, it was 2012, 2013. So right when Yellen was coming, uh, coming in, uh, into the Fed as chairwoman, we were going through Operation Twist and then the beginning of QE2. And as a young analyst at 21, 22, I was ask, asking these CIOs naively and just the, the, uh, thinking back, like the fact that I had the balls, like ask these CIOs these questions, like, you guys worried about like the Fed's manipulation of markets? And they all hand waved it away. And so like after Greenspan had put the put in place, it had become normalized by that point in 2012, 2013. And it was just sort of the expected way that things operate at that point. And to me, as a young man who lived through the great financial crisis, that intuitively just did not make sense to me. And that Around that same time is when I found Bitcoin and decided to really dive down that rabbit hole because I had the juxtaposition of Fed policy with Bitcoin, which has this hardened policy embedded in the protocol. And it just made a lot more intuitive sense to me. Yeah, I mean, we, the, the, you know, 08, 09 was interesting. I mean, I, I was had left Wall Street at the time. I worked as an investment banker for a while, uh, starting in 2001 when I graduated business school. And then uh, was, was following the, you know, 08, 09 crisis pretty closely. I don't think, you know, anyone, and certainly myself included, expected to see, you know, the amount of money that the Fed printed and, you know, the levels they went to bail out the financial system uh, in, in that time period. Yeah. And it's had <laughs> many enormous perver impact. Many right. perverse of effects, which is, yeah. which is what we're here to talk about. You wrote this incredible piece yeah. on Substack. What was it about this time last year, maybe? Um, when was it? It was uh, April 11th of, uh, of last year. It's almost exactly a year, 11 months. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's something I had written. I, you know, I, I, I wrote a lot about economics for the last 15 or 20 years. Um, I, I had a blog that called ibankingfhu.com, which was at the time back, this goes back 15, 20 years, a site for undergraduates and MBA students trying to break into investment banking and sort of a Q&A, an FAQ on, on what investment bankers do and the interview questions that you get asked. And then I started to think, well, I should do the same thing for economics. And so I launched a site called Economics FAQ. My, and my goal at the beginning was to try to answer all the, you know, Econ 101 type of questions. And I have a very different view of Econ 101 than most economists. And I didn't really have the time to do that. And then I just kind of started writing longer pieces about economics. And I'm very critical of, of obviously the Fed, but also of mainstream economics, both micro and macro and behavioral economics. And then... Um, so I've been writing about this stuff for a long time and with a, with a very sort of, you know, free market libertarian bent to everything, Austrian economics, I would say, really. And then, uh, you know, when the whole woke stuff started and, uh, you know, I, I getting aside, but, you know, wrote, I wrote a letter that helped ignite what became the parents movement three years ago in the fight against woke education. And I've lived and breathed kind of the last three years of this woke stuff and something that I've thought about for a long time is that, you know, it's really money and central banking policy that was at the root cause of the woke takeover of society, of the world, really. So, and, and there, you know, it's a complicated argument, um, which, you know, we, we can talk about the different aspects of it, but I really believe it's, it's the incentives that easy money has 
um, changed in the world that that created so many, not all, but so many of the issues that we have today. Yeah, and I think for the first 10 years that I've been in Bitcoin, a lot of the focus of easy money has really been focused on the, um, the wealth disparity that it's created in the country, the cancel on effect. Yep. That's really what a lot of Bitcoiners and me personally have focused on. Uh, I've been writing a newsletter and doing this podcast for seven years now. So for a vast majority leading up to 2020, it was all focused on the perverse incentives of money printing on the wealth disparity and uh, its effect on asset prices. But I think what you really hone in on your piece and I think what many more people become more privy to, it's like much more pernicious than this wealth gap. It, well, it actually has social effects as well. Well, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I came at this, and I, I think that's exactly right, because I wrote a piece for the Economics FAQ blog years ago, what are the root cause of income inequality? Um, you know, income inequality is sort of a, you know, an issue of the left, and they blame capitalism. And the right says, no, it's not so bad, we don't really have it. And I think that's wrong. I think income inequality, I said pre- woke pre 2020 that income inequality and this wealth disparity that you refer to is really the greatest problem affecting america and, and probably the world and i wrote this i think it was like a twenty thousand word piece on that the root cause of income inequality is easy money is the federal reserve and the other central banks of the world and so this piece about you know how woke took over america the first part of that story is exactly the income inequality and the wealth disparity aspect of this. So I think that's a, a key part of the message because, you know, one of the, and we can talk about what the mechanism is for why the income inequality increased and the wealth disparity increased. But the, one of the ways that the left gets people to go woke or to unfit, let me, let me, let me take one step back. I mean, I define woke differently than I think most people. Most people think it's just this idea that there needs to be, you know, we have systemic racism, social justice, we need equity to kind of remedy that. And I believe woke is fundamentally a rejection of America's founding values. It's a rejection of free speech, a rejection of free markets and capitalism, rejection of individual rights and meritocracy, a rejection of objectivity. But if you really want to boil down what woke is, uh, some people call it Marxism. I would argue it's it's not exactly Marxism. It's an update or offshoot of Marxism. It's really anti-capitalism. And the reason that they, you know, the left is able to get so many people, especially young people, on their side is because of the wealth disparity and because of the income inequality. And they say, well, it's capitalism that doesn't work. It's capitalism that has created this, you know, unfair system we have, especially for young people. I think it is an unfair system. I think it is a big problem of, of wealth disparity and income inequality. But again, my view is that the root cause is not capitalism. It's the failure to have capitalism. And the most important reason why we don't have capitalism is because of the central bank uh, by controlling interest rates, which is the most important price in the economy, the price of money. And so I came about this, you know, before I was writing about woke was writing about how, you know, the Fed was the biggest and most important cause of, of the wealth disparity of income inequality. No, and to the uh, the Marxist offshoots credit, it is a really uh, potent um, approach to convincing people that it's capitalism's fault. You really corrupt yeah. capitalism at its core with the, the price of money via the manipulation of interest rates by central banks. And then you lead everybody at like a Pied Piper and just point at the wealth disparity and say, this is capitalism, this is capitalism. It's like we, we don't live in a capitalist society from a first principles perspective. No, like no we, that, that's exactly right, right. From a first principles perspective, we don't. And, and not only because of central banking controlling interest rates, but you know because of regulations, because of unions, because of other things as well. But the biggest factor by far is the manipulation of interest rates. Yeah, money is so literally the, story, the most important tool that we use. It's one half of every transaction. It's like, it's pretty, yeah. no, it pretty is, important it is, thing it to is. get you know, it's, it's in some ways, I mean, you probably talk about this every week. I mean, in some ways, money is, is simple. It's stuff we can use to buy things. You know, I mean, economists have, you know, more complex definitions, unit of exchange, store value, whatever. But effectively, money is something you could use, you know, to buy things with. Um, but but it, it, it's, much, it's you know, on the other hand, it's, it's kind of much more complex. And I think so. very, very few people, you know, even economists understand how important it is, how important interest rates are, what the true drivers of inflation are 
what the mechanism is for you know money creation, um, which is you know much more by the commercial banking system than it is by the Fed. And this is why it's not just simply the Fed having low interest rates. That's only part of the story. It's this Fed not willing to let banks fail and not willing to let the financial system fail that basically told the banking system, take as much risk as you want. Don't worry, we'll never let you fail. And that's where most of the money is actually created, not by the Fed, but by the banking system. And um, capitalism, you know, go back to, uh, um, you know, Schumpeter, you need creative destruction. Capitalism doesn't work when you don't allow things to fail. And that's the situation we're in, where the Fed does not allow bad decisions to be punished. And you have to have that for capitalism to work. Yeah. And I think it's really important to focus on the commercial banks and their part in expanding uh, the, the supply of money throughout the economy. Cause that's also another very effective tactic that the, the Marxist offshoot has. It's like, well, it's actually not the fed. It's the commercial banks. And as you, state like the fact that the fed is there as a backstop creates this perverse incentive for them to go print as much money as possible so they're intertwined at the hip i mean the commercial banks technically own the fed as well so yeah i mean you have you 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 effectively have your you know for what four i think four big banks now i mean you, you effectively have a nationalized banking system um, and it's the industrial policy you know a lot of people say we don't have an industrial policy in this country like you know a communist country would in fact we do it's really the financial more than anything else, it's the financial services sector, to some extent tech as well. Um, but, you know, we're moving towards, you know, having a nationalized banking system. You got four big banks now, you have another financial crisis, and they're inevitable. Um, and I think, a, you know, you can't time it. And I don't know, it could happen next year, it could happen in, you know, a generation, but you'll have more financial crises down the road. And you're going to see continued consolidation to the point where I think we have a nationalized banking system. That's the path that we're on. So I agree. I mean, you cannot separate what the central bank does with, you know, the big banks and the banking system. Now they are, they are joined at the hip, like you said. I'm trying to think of, <clears throat> I want to go on a tangent about New York yeah. uh, community sure. bank corp and the fact that Steve Mnuchin and this consortium of private equity players had to step in to bail them out. Uh, but I think we save that for later in the show to focus on this topic in uh, the, the, the role of central banking in woke culture, because so, I think it's a very important topic to, to really cover in depth. And because you mentioned um, it's not only seeking into the financial sector, it's seeking into this tech sector as well. Um, and so you have it's every mechanism. sector, but yeah, yeah. Finance and tech, I'd say the, the ones that are most impacted, but I'll tell you the story. So, you know, the story I tell about income inequality, um, you know, it's obviously a simplified story, which is, in so you had again you know the, the greenspan put the, the the idea that you're never going to let the financial system fail and that where, where does that come about we should take a step back which is they, they they learned the wrong lessons from the great depression and the lessons that they learned from the great depression was that it was the fed's fault and if they just had more liquidity if they would have printed more money we wouldn't have had a great depression um not understanding that it was easy money that really caused and other things but more than anything else easy money that really caused the great depression but then you kind of go to the late 80s and early 90s and china most importantly but other countries in southeast asia and eastern europe after the fall of communism opened up their economies and started manufacturing stuff and i don't know somewhere between uh, you know maybe somewhere over a billion people maybe between one and two billion people join the global workforce and what that should have had is a deflationary effect on the prices of stuff that we buy because everything that you, you know you and i would go buy at walmart maybe you're too young but um you know saw cheaper prices and that's the kind of good deflation um, the fed doesn't believe there's good deflation the fed is absolutely terrified of deflation believing that it's always monetary this was a this was actually good deflation so but the fed said is that well we don't want deflation we're going to keep printing money with this idea that, you know, we should have a, I don't know if this was an explicit policy, then it became one a little bit later, you know, instead of even having um, price stability, we should shoot for 2% inflation. And so the Fed keeps printing money, they keep their, you know, foot on the, the monetary, you know, accelerator spigot. 
And the money has to go somewhere because again, the things, most of the stuff that we buy at Walmart, prices were going down because of China and, and globalization. And I don't blame globalization per se. So the Fed keeps printing money and it goes broadly speaking four places. It goes to financial assets and that's where the, the huge wealth disparity comes into play. And then the money goes to, you know, the three major categories of things that we can't buy at Walmart, that we can't import from China. And those things are real estate, education, and healthcare. And we saw real estate, education, and healthcare prices dramatically exceed inflation. You know, if inflation was two percent, you know, somewhere around two percent, they were probably six, eight, ten, twelve percent uh, of, of those things. And that is what what crushed the middle class because we lost good jobs. We started outsourcing manufacturing jobs which didn't also have to happen. And that's where you, you kind of get regulation and unions come into play. We didn't allow wages to fall or we, uh, we wouldn't take care of legacy pension costs at steel companies. So we wound up closing steel companies instead of allowing compensation and wages to fall, let's say 20%. Instead, we lost entire industries and wound up outsourcing them. That shouldn't have happened. So you know, the lower and the middle class lost good jobs. At the same time, healthcare costs, real estate costs, cost of education and, and universities, accelerated to an enormous degree. And that absolutely crushed the middle class. And this is where, you know, led to, you know, like Donald Trump being president in 2016, because he was the only one speaking to, you know, this huge segment of America. And we saw the same thing in Europe that had absolutely gotten, you know, crushed by economic policies. Um, so that's where I, you know, I kind of separate the income inequality into, you know, the rise of the 1% or the 0.1%, which was the inflation of the financial assets. And then the middle, the middle class really getting crushed here. And it's not that because of wages fell, it's because we let and subsidized prices to rise. Um, so there, you know, the, the cost of living went up too high. So that, that's sort of my, you know, the short version of the income inequality story. And again, what I said earlier, and we both said is that, you know, that's how they get the young people to blame capitalism, you know, young people who have these ridiculous student loans and can't afford health care and can't afford, you know, to buy a home like previous generations could, well, that goes back to the Federal Reserve. Uh, but they are taught and indoctrinated in schools to blame capitalism for that. It's not capitalism. It's the lack of capitalism. So that's sort of yeah. the income inequality story. And when you lay it out, it's extremely pernicious when you think about it. That's <laughs> like, it was the, <clears throat> maybe global, it globalization. You know, it, it, was, it wasn't that they were trying to hurt people. And that's the thing about, you know, economists and the Fed. They, they, like most people, I mean, they mean well. They believe these models work. They believe they're doing the right thing. They do not understand. If they don't understand Econ 101. No. I think. I mean, it's like you enable globalization. So you take out all the good jobs. You print a bunch of yeah. money. Cantillon effect kicks in, financial assets explode, wealth gap increased. Uh, you take all the good jobs and you tell people, you know what, to get a really good job, you got to go to university. So you go hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt. And guess what? You're going to have degree inflation there and your degree is not going to be as competitive or worth as much when you go eventually hit the job market. And then on top of that, we're going to subsidize uh, high fructose corn syrup, making you extremely unhealthy, which are going to increase right. your, your healthcare costs once you get out of college and into the workforce and eat this industrial sludge. Pretty much. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then on top of that, we're going to tell you you're a bad person. If you believe in the nuclear family and that, uh, right. Right. That you don't, you don't agree to all the, uh, cultural concessions we're trying to force on you. And if you don't, right. If you don't, you know, transition your kid and you know, all, all these things. Yeah. yeah. You don't want reparations. Yeah. You're a bad person. And guess what the banks, but again, control, and that's monet monetary supply. If you don't go along, they'll cut off your bank account and, um, you well, that too. Money. Right, 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 right. Social credit scores and systems. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All this, all this stuff becomes related. I mean, I, in the piece I wrote that you referenced, you know, how woke took over America. You know, I get the question all the time is, you know, what's, is there a James Bond villain, right? Is there one bad, is there a Klaus Schwab? Is there Bill Gates, you know, George Soros? You know, is there one evil? It's so brilliant. The left's takeover of the world. Is there one, you know, evil genius behind it? And the answer is no. I mean, again, I think, you know, the incentives caused by monetary policy and easy money is is the most important root cause. But, it, you know, it's not that there is an evil genius, I think, you know, trying to take over the world. It's, you know, so many different aspects using the incentives for their own purposes. Um, you know, and, and in the end, what happens is, you know, they're trying to tear down Western civilization, which is, you know, what 
what I think is happening. Um, Do you think we can turn back the tide at all? Do I think we can turn back the tide? Well, you know, I'm running for Congress in uh, Florida. I'd never, something I never ever thought I'd do. I never had any political aspirations. And I said, you know what, we need good people to step up who understand what's going on. And very few people do and understand what it takes to fight back and, you know, have the courage to fight back to try to turn the tide and try to save this country and save Western civilization. And that's my mission. I'm, you know, one person can't do it. I don't even know that it's necessarily doable, but I know that we've, we've got to try because if we lose, we're in a new dark ages and, and we are losing, you know, this, this battle right now. So, um, you know, we're trying, but, but this is where, you know, the education is so important is that we've got to educate Americans and, and even educate, you know, our political leaders, um, about what are the correct root causes? Because I think, you know, from the, you know, the, the money perspective and the monetary policy perspective, almost nobody understands this. Almost nobody understands how pernicious easy money has been and how how much it has, you know, affected, you know, our economy in a bad way. They don't, they don't understand that at all. And I think that's a product of just the complexity of it all. Like when you, when you, especially as time goes on, if you look at all these facilities that the Fed is, is putting forth, uh, BTFP, um, you had the ripping out of reserve requirements in 2020, um, uh, going back to post-2008, QE1, Operation Twist, QE2, it's just all, all these buzzwords and complex um, financial arrangements between the Fed and the banking system and then preferred dealers as well. It's just so much to unpack and unravel. It's almost, uh, it's too hard to overcome just from a, just the point of trying to actually understand how it all works. Oh, it's incredibly, com you know, the, the actual mechanism of Fed activity or central bank activity is incredibly complex. And there's no way the average you know, person is going to be able to understand that. But just, but I think even the, you know, the very, very basics of what easy money or, or what even, you know, just money, how it impacts the economy and how easy money impacts the economy and how it subsidizes and picks winners and losers. That's something that is not that hard to understand. You know, we, 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 you know, again, in Econ 101, they don't really cover this because I don't think they get it right. But that's something that I think we can educate people on, you know, what what does easy money, what does subsidizing high risk investments do? You know, what does printing money do? It's got to go somewhere. The money has to go somewhere. Where is it gone? What is the impact of that? You know, what is the impact of inflating financial assets? What is the impact of telling banks Take any risk you want because we always have your back. We'll always bail you out. That's not that hard to understand. Um, but no one, you know, very few of us are saying it. And we've gotten meeting more people explaining it and saying it. Quick break here, freaks. This rip is brought to you by Gradually Then Suddenly, a framework for understanding Bitcoin as money by Parker Lewis. I wrote the foreword to the book. I'm honored to have done so because it's the best zero to one primer if you're looking for a logical explanation of why Bitcoin obsoletes all other money. Buy one for yourself and maybe a few for your friends. Go to thesafehouse.com slash gradually. That's thesafehouse.com, safe spelled S-A-I-F, thesafehouse.com slash gradually. Use the promo code TFTC for $5 off at checkout. Buy it now, freaks. The price of Bitcoin is going up. You need to understand it. This is the best zero to one primer. Back to the show. What I worry about is that we're, we've reached a point of no return in terms of the Fed is put their foot on yeah. the gas pedal and they've yeah. essentially put the car over the, uh, over the ledge. And what they have to do is just like push the gas pedal through the floor and hope that the car can fly. <laughs> and Oh, I think that's right. Oh yeah. No, I think there, there, there is no pulling back from this. And this is why I, I've said, you know, for 30 years, you know, th th this isn't going to end well sooner or later. I, I mean, honestly, I thought 08, 09 would be the end. I didn't expect them to be able to bail out the system. I mean, the amount of money they printed, you know, during those couple of years and, you know, zero interest rates or even negative interest rates around the world for, the, you know, for almost 10 years um, was dramatic. It's going to happen again. Every bailout, and there's been so many, and again, I go back to 87, there's been so many, many of which we don't even remember, um, every one has been bigger than the one before. I mean, how much bigger can they get? So I think it is inevitable that the system collapses. Again, I'm not going to say it's 
this year. I don't, I, it might not be for a generation. Like I said earlier, I don't think you can time it, which is why it's very hard to trade it. You know, you can't short the market if it's going to take 30 years for the market to crash. You can't maybe protect yourself with alternative assets like, like you know, Bitcoin and others. But um, I think it's inevitable that, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse here, but, you know, sooner or later, the shit hits the fan. It's going to happen. This is not, you know, there's no way for them to pull back from this. They, they have gone fully into this, you know, kicking the can down the road. Every time there's a crisis, they're going to employ the playbook, expand the playbook of, of money printing and bailing out Wall Street. Yeah, and it's even more daunting when you consider the fiscal side of things. It's only accelerating. Oh, yeah. Oh, we've got, you know, 30, whatever the number is, 30 plus trillion dollar debt. You know, we're running trillion dollar deficits. You know, the interest now, you know, when interest rates were 1% on treasuries, it's one thing. Now they're much, more, you know, 5%. It's it, it's not sustainable. We've got, you know, welfare system. We've got, uh, you know, Social Security and Medicare that, you know, politicians aren't allowed to talk about because you get in trouble if you say you're going to, you know, ever change it or cut benefits or expand retirement ages. But it is completely insolvent. It is completely unsustainable. I mean, sooner or later, we're in trouble. There's no question about that. Plus, you know, birth rates are low. We're not, we, you know, we're, we're not working. We're living longer, working less. Um, you know, it's, there, we, there are a lot of problems here that make the whole financial system, and the whole economy unsustainable. Yeah. And so you mentioned Bitcoin as an alternative asset. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin more broadly? Cause that's obviously everyone that's shows thing. Bitcoin shows. Yeah. That I've got a I, clock. You know, I'm going to concede that. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, it's not something that I have. I wrote a piece on it. I was actually years ago. Um, a little bit skeptical that it ever actually becomes money. In other words, it can be used as a speculative asset. Maybe it's a somewhat of an insurance policy like gold is to a lot of people or other hard assets. Um, you know, somewhat skeptical that it ever can replace, you know, the kind of money we have now. Um, so I, I can see it. I'm not all that knowledgeable about Bitcoin or crypto in general. Uh, obviously, it's at we're at a record high again. I don't know when this will air, but I think we hit record high again with Bitcoin, you know, this week. Um, you know, I in my early days when I was actually reading a lot, I don't have so much time now, and I was really into this idea of uh, going back to you know what they used to call free banking, which is actually have mm -hmm. banks print their own currency and ending, you know, the government monopoly on money which which is effectively what crypto and bitcoin does um which i think is obviously a good thing we need alternatives to you know central banking money or, or government monopolistic money um but you know i i, I am skeptical and and don't kill me or don't have your viewers your listeners kill me. i, I I'm promise skeptical what the viewers will do i won't kill yeah. you though, don't worry okay you know i i don't i don't i i think government can shut it down which is which i worry about any crypto for that matter or they can at least, if not shut it down, prevent it from being utilized. You may be able to utilize it for certain things, but as far as utilizing in a store, they can say, look, to a store, we saw this in COVID where they were, you know, shut down businesses um, for lots of reasons. We lost more freedoms, you know, those couple of years than I think we ever had in our 250 year history. And I worry they can say to a, you know, a place of business, you know, we'll shut you down if you accept anything other than, you know, US currency. And so I, you know, worry about that a little bit. I think, you know, the um, energy consumption issue, um, I don't know if that's being dealt with differently now. I mean, it's so energy intensive for, for mining. Um, but I think it's interesting. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I think all alternatives to central banking money, I'm, I'm thrilled to see them yeah. because I'm, I'm not in favor of central banking money. Yeah, Hal Finney, who was early Bitcoin and the first ever individual to... Uh, receive a Bitcoin transaction from Satoshi back in 2009. He wrote a blog or a forum post in December of 2010. Hal's no longer with us, but in this forum post on BitcoinTalk.org, he basically said, at scale, Bitcoin's not going to be able to scale. You're not going to be able to have everyday transactions on the protocol level. What we will see is a free banking system built on top of Bitcoin, where you have all these private banks that have Bitcoin as a reserve asset and they issue maybe something like Chalmy and eCash yeah. tokens on top of it. I, I love that idea. I, you know, and, and what you could have in a real free, not that we're likely to happen, at least maybe after, not, not until there's a crisis and there's a real, re, you know, we need a reset, not the, you know, great reset they talk about, but I think at some point we're going to have a reset. But to have a free banking system where you do have money backed by Bitcoin, you might have other banks say we're going to back it by gold or something else. 
that's what I would love to see, you know, real competitive money, not just competitive banking, but competitive money. And if Bitcoin winds up being the most stable, effective, you know, backing for money, that'd be fantastic. And if it's something else, you know, like gold or something else, fine. Um, but I think that that's from a libertarian and, and you know, a, and a free market perspective. I think that's what would be the ideal kind of money out there, competitive money. Yeah. It's happening. It's happening right now. It's monetizing in real time. And to your energy <clears throat> consumption point, that's actually where I think the signal is because the mainstream mer- narrative that Bitcoin mining is bad because it consumes a lot of energy is really completely misunderstood. It does use a lot of energy. We're going to use a lot more energy and that's a good thing. Uh, but what you find is due to the hyper competitive nature of Bitcoin mining, uh, they are forced via economic incentives to find the lowest cost electricity possible. Yeah. And what you find is that that's typically wasted or stranded energy sources, whether that's substations that have excess capacity they're not utilizing um, or natural gas is otherwise being flared. That's one of the first companies I started in the space. That's what we did. We went to the Bakken. We went to oil and gas producers that were flaring a bunch of gas and um, flaring above what the EPA was allowing them to. So they're getting fined. We're like, Hey, we'll solve your problem. Run it through this generator. We'll mine Bitcoin with it. You can monetize this. And what we're going to find, what we are finding, particularly down here in ERCOT, um, with these mining operations that plug into the grid and participate in demand response, um, to make sure that residential consumers can get electricity during times of peak demand is that it's actually bolstering the balance sheets of these utilities companies and these, these grid operators so that they can go reinvest and build more infrastructure. So I think Bitcoin mining does consume a lot of energy. We're gonna consume a crazy amount of energy at scale when when this does succeed, but it's gonna be good because it's gonna mean that we have a cheap, abundant energy future. Yeah, that's fascinating. No, I didn't know that. I mean, this is again, where I'm probably less knowledgeable than any of your listeners about this, um, but that is very interesting to hear. No, Andrew, you didn't know this, but I, I invited you on the show can I, so I can accept these ideas in your brain so when you get on Capitol Hill, you can begin um, pushing this narrative at, uh, at the federal right. government level. Yeah. That sounds good. No, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll meet in person and uh, we'll talk more about it. But no, no, again, I'm not, you know, it's, it's not, you know, we're so busy with the campaign. I haven't had a chance to, you know, keep up on everything, even a lot of the economic stuff that I used to really keep up on and write about. But yeah. Um, you know, this is not one that I have been able to focus on for the last couple of years. So it's really interesting to hear what, you know, this is cutting edge stuff um, and to hear what is really going on rather than, you know, the narrative that you may read once in a while in the mainstream media, which as we all know, is not always the true narrative. No, no. And I think like, that's what I think this country needs right now too, is like a, an optimistic thing to point at and work towards, which I'm interested to get your, because it seems like, the country is in a state of disarray. I think it's uh, appropriate to say that. Uh, if you look at, we got problems. We've got we've got a lot of problems. There's not a lot of hope out there. And so, I guess on, on that line of thinking, like, what do you think we have to be hopeful for as a country? Like, what should we be striving for? Well, look, I mean, we're still the, you know, freest, most prosperous country in the world, safest. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we've got talent, we've got enormous resources, we've got good people that want to do the right thing. You know, it, it's not all doom and gloom. I think we have a political class that isn't necessarily, you know, generally isn't leading us in the right direction. Um, you know, we've got this elitist takeover of the world. And, you know, again, our freedoms have been taken away in many respects over the last few years, censorship, you know, all these issues, again, a lot of these issues, which do go back to, you know, what I wrote about, about the woke takeover and, and the impact of monetary policy in, in that. Um, but we, you know, look, there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of smart people around doing interesting things. There's a lot of people with good ideas. So it's not like, uh, you know, there, there isn't reason to be optimistic. Uh, but I do think, and this is again why you know why I run for political office is a lot of these problems are going to have to be solved politically. Um, you know some of these bigger issues, and, and you know and the woke stuff, which I believe, you know, has really taken over you know most of the institutions of our country. That that's what's most scary to me, and especially in terms of education, because you indoctrinate kids, you know, at Harvard and Penn and universities. It's one thing you start doing it in kindergarten. And you basically indoctrinate them, not only is America bad, but capitalism is bad. 
th th that's what's really frightens me about the long term. And we've got to change that. We've got to fight back on that. Um, How pervasive is that problem? Very pervasive, sadly. Very. You know, I, I, I had a piece in, I don't know, again, I don't know when this airs. I had a piece in today's New York Post uh, about the private school indoctrination, the elite private school K through 12 indoctrination. But it's in it's in every school. And the reason it's almost in every school, public, private, even religious schools, and much worse in a place like New York City or on the West Coast or the Northeast, you know, certainly much better or least, less worse in a place like, you know, Texas and Florida. But even in red states, I mean, the entire education system has been taken over by this very progressive ideology. Uh, and it is run by progressives, not just teachers, but the whole ecosystem of education. And that's not going to be easy to to take back, but we've got to try. I mean, the left took, you know, gen as they say, took generations really to march through the institutions and we're going to have it to have a counter revolution and do the same thing. We need to build new institutions, but we can't just give up on, you know, the K through 12 schools and the public schools and the universities because you know, the vast majority of Americans kids are going to continue to go to those schools. And so we've got to we've got to fight back in, in Florida here. They just DeSantis just passed legislation to, you know, teach the evils of communism in kindergarten. Uh, I'm not sure that might be too young to do that. <laughs> but the idea is right, is that, you know, we, we talk a lot about civics education. We don't have it. We don't teach about our government. Um, I think the most important part of civics education, which I think they get here in Florida, is, you know, it's less about checks and balances and about the, you know, executive, legislative and judicial branches of government. And it, it is more about you know, why capitalism and freedom and, and, you know, classical liberalism are right and why communism has been a disaster every place it's been tried in, in history. So I am, ha again, kindergarten might be too young to, to, uh, to do that, but I think the idea is right. We need to, you know, be doing that more broadly because uh, right now kids are being taught that, you know, capitalism is bad and evil and that our country is bad and evil. And that's a real problem. It really is. And you mentioned like rebuilding institutions, obviously with Penn and Harvard in the news cycle for their, their woke policies. It's been a really interesting conversation because a lot of people are talking about like, we need to go into Harvard, weed out all the bad actors and rebuild that institution. And I've been thinking about this just behind the scenes, like just um, the whole concept of rebuilding institution and what is an institution. I think um, a lot of people that, want to like go into Harvard to weed out the communist and replace it with free market thinkers to rebuild that institution or thinking about it wrong. The institution is really the idea, very touch truth. Like, um, and it's, it's letting go of the prestige of a Harvard, a pen, if you will, and really anchoring back to the first principles ideas that these institutions were originally built on. You don't necessarily have to go in and fix Harvard specifically, you just have to get these ideas out there and erect a, a new institution on top of the ideas that they were founded on. Well, I, you know, in that in that piece, you know, how we'll talk over America, I talk a lot about how education, you know, got taken over both K through 12 and universities. Um, but I, again, go, going back to, what, uh, you know, there, there, I think I had five or six ways why the monetary policy you know, led to this takeover. One of them was the inc income inequality story. Um, but another one is that, and it's, it's obviously related, is that for the last generation or even two generations, most smart people in this country didn't went into finance and then tech. Why? Because salaries and finance and later tech were, you know, enormously, if not orders of magnitude, greater than salaries they could make elsewhere, including in academia. So again, this subsidy of Wall Street, which we didn't talk about, also subsidized tech um, over the last you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, what it went, wound up doing is it stripped out or denuded almost every other field of not, not just smart people, but people who would likely be on the side of uh, you know, free markets and, you know, classical liberal values, conservative values. And so science, medicine, politics, journalism, and especially academia, smart people don't go into them anymore. Very smart people. They go into finance because they can make a lot more money or they go into tech because they can make a lot more money. So when we talk about, you know, to go back to what you were saying about taking Harvard back, you know, we all have seen statistics on 
you know, the ratio of Republicans to Democrats or the ratio of people on the left to the right in universities. And it can be anywhere from, you know, six to 10 to one, in some cases, 100 to one or, or to zero in a lot of the social sciences. You don't have any Republicans. You don't have any conservatives. Well, the, you know, we have a problem is that there are very, very few academics on the right or even in the center in this country because for two generations, people who would have been those kind of academics, especially men, have been sucked into finance and tech. Um, so that is also not an easy problem to solve. Again, to me, that goes back to subsidizing Wall Street. It inflated salaries on Wall Street and in private equity firms and in hedge funds and in investment banks and, uh, you know, and, and in big tech and in tech startups. Um, until you strip the money out and let those institutions fail that should fail. And again, I'm, I have nothing against you know, tech and I have nothing against finance, but you got to stop subsidizing it. And until you stop subsidizing it, you're going to see those inflated salaries, which means you're not going to see smart people in other areas that are important to society like academia. So taking back Harvard and Penn is not easy because we don't necessarily have the people that can teach the right things anymore or very few of them. Well, that's another scary prospect. I discussed this last week on the show, but the competency crisis, this misallocation of capital and skewing the yep. incentives in such a way where it forces people into tech and in finance. I mean, we're maybe And I'm guilty generation. as any, you know, I was a finance guy and then a tech guy. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody, but you follow the incentives. Same, same. same. And you, you can't blame people for following the incentives, but I mean, we could wake up in a generation, maybe two generations and literally not have the engineers that are capable of maintaining the society that we've built up over the last couple centuries. Like yeah. li literally can't replace the pipes, can't drill yeah. the oil, can't run the nuclear facility. Like if incentives are skewed for long enough, you literally lose the knowledge of how to do this stuff, which is very oh, yeah. scary. And it's, you know, and it's scary, it's scary in medicine, especially we're seeing, you know, localified medical schools, which means two things. It means who you're letting in, um, as well as the smart people that are no longer going into medicine, but now you're, you're lowering the standards significantly. And then what you're teaching them, you know, you, you, you start teaching them, you know, DEI related stuff, you stop teaching them anatomy. And it's very scary. You know, you think about 10, 20 years going to see your doctor that's completely unqualified. So you're right, the whole, you know, the infrastructure of the country is under attack by this ideology. And it is it is frightening. Yeah, just look at what's happening with Boeing right now. <laughs> look at Look at the, it's sneak, snuck into the Air Force. We had Matt Lohmeyer on the show a couple months ago who went on Capitol Hill to blow the whistle on their DEI quotas. They want to reduce the number of white male fighter, pli fighter pilots from 87% to 60, some arbitrary percentage. And it's not merit-based. It's right. a, the whole retreat from a merit-based society, again, a, a communist society. Uh, retreat away from merit towards communism is not playing out well for us right now. No, and, and I, you know, we're, we're we're still in the beginning stages of it, and that, but we've got again, we've got to fight to to take that back. But that's why I said, what is woke? It is fundamentally a rejection of those founding values, including meritocracy. Yeah, and we've had a war on merit for, you know, goes back to really you know the beginning of affirmative action, uh, you know, fifty or sixty years ago. Yeah. Do you think it's so bad there's a period of time where people probably need to homeschool their children to teach them this stuff from scratch and then um, make sure? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I tried actually to, to homeschool my daughter for a couple of months. It was, you know, with a with a 14-year-old girl, it's hard. You can kind of, it's easier to do it in the younger years. Um, we're seeing a lot more people homeschool now. People that never used to do it. It was a demographic, tend to be very religious people that would do it. We're seeing way more people, even in places like New York City, do homeschool or do homeschooling, you know, small pods and co-ops. Uh, I think that's a trend that's going to continue, you know, for a long time because the schools have private and public have deteriorated to such an extent. Um, and it's not only just the woke stuff that's infiltrated. It's also the fact that, you know, they're not teaching just the, you know, literacy rates and math rates. We see this around the country are abysmal. The number of kids that are reading and doing math, you know, proficiently or on grade level. And people see that. People saw that, you know, with COVID closures, that schools were closed for so long, you know, and it became apparent that, you know, the schools and the teachers unions don't have the interest of kids at heart. And so you saw a lot of parents pull their kids out of the school system and homeschool. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I think families that can do it should do it. But 
I'm also not, you know, I'm also understanding of the fact that it is not easy to do. I mean, it requires an enormous amount of time and effort. Um, it's almost impossible to do if you have, you know, a two uh, parent working, you know, two, two, two income household, you really need someone doing it full time. So it's not something that, you know, most families can do, but I think for families that can do it, uh, yeah, I think you can get a much better education. You can educate your kids much better in a, you know, in less time. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proponent of it, but it's hard. Yeah. I'm, I'm about to find out. I've got a four-year-old son. I think I'm going to, I bought the, uh, how to read in a hundred lessons book. I'm gonna, that's going to be my foray into homeschooling and sitting down oh, with him. <laughs> trying to teach them how to read. Yeah, let me know. Yeah. Let me know how it goes. No, no. I, again, I think with young kids, it's obviously a lot easier and they get to middle school, high school, it gets a lot, a lot tougher, but, um, I, I wish you luck in that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see more and more parents doing it. Thank you. I'm going to need it. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But um, before we wrap up here, since you formerly worked at the Federal Reserve and have been following this for decades, what are your thoughts on the current position that Jerome Powell and crew find themselves in? Obviously, we had a CPI print that was higher than expected today. Yeah. And we had NYCB uh, had to get bailed out by this private equity consortium uh, last week or the week before. They've already signaled that they'd like to lower rates, but with inflation running hot, um, and a banking crisis that seems to be bubbling up again. <laughs> do you yeah. do you envy Jerome Powell's uh, position at all right now? No, look, I, I don't. I, I don't envy Jerome Powell's position. Um, I, I, but but then again, I'm I'm critical that I don't think he maybe he's better than others. You know, he might have been better than a uh, Bernanke or Janet Yellen. But I, I again, I don't really think they understand how the economy works. Um, I think they are stuck. Now they're sort of in a holding pattern. My guess is they're praying nothing bad happens before the November election because they're going to get, and I'm sure have been getting, you know, tremendous political pressure from the Biden administration, you know, to lower interest rates. I mean, I think you're starting to see the housing market slow down. Uh, you know, people can't get mortgages. Mortgage rates are whatever they are, three times as high as they were, you know, a year or two ago. Um, I think they had, you know, had been closer to lowering rates again. And I, I think you're right. I mean, the CPI numbers today makes it, you know, almost impossible to do it. They've sort of been able to play the narrative that that they succeeded in this, you know, Goldilocks soft landing. Uh, again, my view is that sooner or later, it's it's going to come, it's going to come crashing down. I mean, you can't not have, you know, commercial real estate's a disaster. Um, I mean, that's a ticking time bomb. Again, you know, people can't get mortgages. And so you're going to have to, you, you're going to start to see at some point pressures in the financial markets, which means they're going to start lowering. They're going to reinflate. And, you know, who knows? Um, but this is, this is the cycle that they're in, that they put themselves in again, not just in the last few years, not just from, you know, the financial crisis of 0809, but I go back to, you know, what is now 30 plus 35 plus years of, they're never going to let Wall Street fail. Every time there's, you know, the hint of a crisis, they start to reinflate. And this is just a cycle that never ends. So someday it's going to end. So and that was my very long winded answer to say, I think they're, you know, in a holding pattern kind of stuck. Um, you know, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, it feels like um, <laughs> they're finding themselves in a situation that Spider-Man was in at the end of Spider-Man 1 where the Green Goblin is going to drop Mary Jane or the, the, the car of people, uh, above right. the, above right. the Hudson river. And, uh, so the feds going to have to choose like, uh, do we keep fighting inflation or do we save the banking system? Uh, and this isn't a superhero movie. I don't think they're going to be able to save both. <laughs> so, no. no, well, there was also uh, you're probably too young, the original Superman with Christopher Reeves, which is probably the best superhero movie. I think, um, same, same kind of thing where Lex Luthor goes to, to, to uh, like nuclear weapons or rockets or something, one to the East Coast, one to the West Coast. Superman promises he's going to save someone's mother, his girlfriend's mother or something on the East Coast, and therefore they destroy all of California. But what he's able to do is fly around the Earth really, really fast, go back in time so he can save both. So, you know, superhero movies, you can do it. I think the Fed, the Fed's always going to bail out Wall Street, always. You can be assured of that, you know, until they can't, um, until it just becomes the money spigot is it, it just doesn't work but they're going to keep trying to bail out wall street and i think what people always have to remember is you can't separate monetary policy from politics which is you know every fed chairman gets pressure from the current administration to do what 
to lower interest rates and to print money. And that's always going to be the case. You know, we, we I think we, you might have touched on this earlier. I mean, this, yes, the Fed theoretically is supposed to be independent. I mean, that's just not the reality of the world. They are just another arm of the government. Um, to some extent, they're an arm of Wall Street, but for sure they're going to get political pressure. If you see any slowdown of the economy, um, you're going to get pressure to to print money again. And I think that's, you know, we'll see over the next few months leading up to the November election what happens. But yeah, they're, they're, they're stuck. They're, they're winning an unwinnable situation, but they put themselves in that unwinnable situation uh, with, with the, again, the way they've been operating for, for many decades. Yeah. I mean, you had Biden, I believe, at a campaign event earlier this week say, hey, we're going to get we're going to get those people to lower lower that rate, like saying it explicitly. Yeah. He's so out of his mind that uh, he doesn't even recognize that he's not supposed to say that explicitly. But um, it's supposed to be. Well, yeah, he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't. You know, I don't know what he recognizes, but but every president wants easy money. Yeah. Uh, last question word that cannot be said hyperinflation is that uh is that a possibility here because you said reinflate oh yeah it's, it's not even oh, really yeah, reinflating it's continuing right. inflation that's not yeah. been solved I, I look yes i again i think someday and that could be tomorrow and that could be not even on our lifetimes but probably somewhere in between you're gonna have the system blow up like it very very close you know almost did or really did in 0809 um and there's two possible paths. You know, one is the hyperinflationary path, and one is the hyperdeflationary path where we default. I mean, effectively, they're the same thing. They're both effectively defaults. Um, which way they go, I think it could go either way. Um, you know, what I, 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 you know, when I was writing on this more frequently, and I used to always get asked for investment advice, I never gave um, again because you, 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 you never know timing. But um, you know, how do you protect yourselves from from that kind of situation, I don't know how you protect yourselves. Um, you know, they say in a crisis, all correlations go to one. And so I'm not sure there are any safe assets. Maybe Bitcoin is, maybe gold is, maybe, you know, farmland is, I don't know. But um, I, I do think it's inevitable we have a financial crisis that the Fed can't print its way out of some day. And for sure, that could wind up in hyperinflation or it could go the other way. And either way is going to be very, very painful. Um, there's no way out of the pain sooner or later. We just, it's unsustainable what, what central banking has done. And not just in these, the United States, but around the world. You know, the debt levels are unsustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. Andrew, thank you for getting this message out there. Um, with that being said, like, is, <clears throat> if there anybody who's listening to this that could help with your campaign, a lot of Floridians listen to the show, what, uh, what should they... Yeah. Or should we point them to learn more? Yeah. Um, my website is andrewgutman.com, which is a G-U-T-M-A-N-N, -N, one T, two N's. You can learn about more of me and the campaign. Read my Brearley letter that uh, went viral three years ago, helped ignite what became the parents movement. Uh, reach out. Love to chat. If anyone wants to contribute to the campaign, that's fantastic. We don't we don't think Bitcoin would pr probably should. I don't know if that's allowed under federal rules, but uh, but andrewgutman.com and, uh, and on Twitter at Andrew Gutman. So reach out. Well, Andrew, keep fighting the good fight. Um, I wish you well throughout the rest of this year. We need more individuals like yourself in the halls of D.C., despite uh, the fact that we may not like D.C. and Capitol Hill. I think it is, oh, I don't like, like you said, Capitol Hill. <laughs> you have to play the game. Yeah. Uh, we need better people in these positions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're a good person. No, we need good people to do it. So, uh, so, well, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun to do this. Yeah, well, and good to, luck uh, all the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to need it. Um, that, that's all we got today, freaks. Peace and love. Okay.